Okay, guys. Book video. Assemble. I don't know why I did that. What's that noise? That was really creepy. There's nothing to wear. Did you guys hear that? I'm scared. Um, I am here today to tell you what my current favorite books of all time are. Like any bookish individual, I fear naming concretely what my favorite books are. So I'm not doing that. <laughs> so what I'm going to do today is share with you what my current favorite books are, books that have had the biggest impact on me, that I've enjoyed the most, etc., etc. And so let's just dive right in. The first book that I am going to be talking about today is called Catherine by Anya Setin. Um, brief plot of this is pretty much the lifespan of this individual, Catherine, who is actually Catherine Swinford. She was a real historical figure. Um, I'm sure some of the things in here are dramatized, but I think that Anya Setin did a fair bit of research and then obviously dramatized the rest. It's fiction. Um, I will read the description in the back just because I feel like it does a better job than I will probably do at describing it. Um, Catherine comes to the court of Edward III at the age of 15 and is dazzled by the feasts, jousts, and entertainments of the wealthy nobles. She is naive, convent-educated, and the orphan of a penniless knight. Nevertheless, she is beautiful and she turns the head of a number of young men, including the king's favorite son, John of Gaunt, but he is married and soon to be betrothed. A few years later, their paths cross again, and this time their passion for each other cannot be denied or suppressed. Catherine becomes the prince's mistress and discovers an extraordinary, wor extraordinary world of power, pleasure, and passion. This kind of makes it sound like a Harlequin romance novel. It's not. Um, just like a really beautiful medieval book really sucks you in. I love how it's like expansive over, you know, decades of life. Um, just found it really, really beautiful. I really just enjoyed my time in this world. Um... I found the writing to be really, really well done. I feel like sometimes in my experience, some of the fantasy novels that I've read, um, not fantasy, but I don't know. I just didn't feel like the writing was sacrificed. Um, I felt like the writing was really well done and, um, yeah, I just thought it was really, really beautiful. And something that's really interesting about this too, is that Catherine Swinford and John of Gaunt, um, you know, they had their situation, but she is actually the sister-in-law of Jeffrey Chaucer. For real, Jeffrey Chaucer. Jeffrey freaking Chaucer in real life was her brother-in-law because um, he married her older sister. Um, and then also, I think King Henry VIII is maybe, I think, a close descendant. I'm, guys, I'm really not sure, but I think, like, this is close to the Tudor line, Somebody, somebody, please correct me if I'm wrong, but dazzling world of feasts and jousts and medievalness um, and just really well written. Writing wasn't sacrificed and Catherine is a wonderful character who I enjoyed following through the years and I, I thoroughly enjoyed this. The next book that we have is my beloved Daphne du Maurier, Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca. Um, this book is, um, you know what? I'm just going to read the description on this one as well. It says, working as a lady's companion, the heroine of Rebecca learns her place. Her future looks bleak until on a trip to the south of France, she meets Max de Winter, a handsome widower whose sudden proposal of marriage takes her by surprise. She accepts, but whisked from glamorous Monte Carlo to the ominous and brooding Manderley, the new Miss de Winter finds Max a changed man. And the memory of his dead wife, Rebecca, is forever kept alive by the forbidding housekeeper, Miss Danvers. Not since Jane Eyre is a heroine face of difficulty with the other woman. An international bestseller that has never gone out of print, Rebecca is the haunting story of a young girl consumed by love and the struggle to find her own identity. So what's super interesting is that the actual main character's name is never said. Um, it's literally named after the other woman and it just lends into this whole theme of her feeling like she's invisible. Um, and it's just, honestly, Rebecca is atmosphere. Daphne du Maurier is just the queen of atmosphere. Um, there is, I feel like the reason this book was so wonderful is it's, it's unsettling, but it's, it's not like a horror novel or anything like that, but it is just 
it's unsettling and it's atmospheric and it's like in my opinion the perfect like fall time read um and it's very nostalgic and I'm a very nostalgic person so I found that to be really really beautiful um and it really resonated with me and I mean she managed to make descriptions of like flowers just so stunning that I was just like hanging on every word that she was writing uh, or that was written and so this is something that I highly recommend um I would I would recommend this to anybody and especially as like a atmospheric fall you know cozy read with a cup of tea kind of thing um I'm just gonna read a quick quote out of this and let's see what will I choose 12 seconds later says all I remember is the feeling of the leather seats the texture of the map upon my knee the frayed ed its frayed edges its worn seams and how one day looking at the clock I thought to myself this moment now at 20 at 20 past 11 this must never be lost and I shut my eyes to make the experience more lasting when I opened my eyes we were by a bend in the road and the peasant girl and a shawl and a black shawl waved to us I can see her now her dusty skirt, her gleaming, friendly smile, and in a second we passed the bend, could see her no more. Already she belonged to the past. She was only a memory. Come on, y'all. That's amazing. Um, okay, let's see. The next book is... Um, the next book is a Christian book, and I'm holding it upside down and backward. <laughs> there you go. Um, the next book is a Christian book. And so if you're not a Christian, I still think you could very much benefit by the information inside, but it definitely comes at it from a Christian lens. So be warned, skip by this if you're not interested. It's called The Ruthless Elimination of Hurry, and it's by Pastor John Mark Comer. Um, he has a church in Portland called Bridgetown, which I really enjoy and tune into weekly. Um, and so this book is is basically how to stay emotionally healthy and spiritually alive in the chaos of a modern world. And that is, that is what it is. So, I mean, um, I'm going to see if there's chapter headings, um, you know, part one, the problem, hurry, the great enemy of spiritual life, a brief history of speed, not the drug. <laughs> Something is deeply wrong to the solution. Hint, the solution isn't more time. Um, what we're, uh, the secret of the easy yoke, what we're really talking about is a rule of life, weight, what are the spiritual disciplines, four practices for unhurrying your life, silence and solitude, Sabbath, simplicity, slowing, epilogue, quiet life. So it just basically goes through and it comes at it from a spiritual lens, again, a Christian lens specifically, um, of basically how to slow down your life, why you should slow down your life, why the solution isn't more time, the necessity of having margins in your life, this necessity of having digital boundaries in this, in this modern age and just things like that. And man, this spoke to me massively because it's not just talking about hurry in like a, you're a super busy person. Cause I'm not a super busy person. I'm not. Um, it's, it's talking about it in mo many facets. So for me, the, the one that really just resonated was like this hurriness this hurried nature in your spirit and this kind of like, you know, you're always on your phone and you kind of feel like mentally frayed and you're just kind of like distracting yourself into oblivion. And so, um, yeah. And there's another book that I'm starting to read called make time by some people who worked at Google. I can't remember their name. Um, and they specifically, they're like, there's, there's two ways in which people basically just like fast forward their life. Um, and it's like infinity pools. So like there is basically so many ways in which you can just distract yourself into oblivion and there's endless content, anything you can refresh and there's new content. So Instagram, YouTube, Twitter, blah, blah, blah. Um, Netflix, Netflix. <laughs> and then there's, um, the busy bandwagon. So it's like you overcommit yourself and you're just constantly running from one engagement to another. And so for me, I definitely fall into like the infinity pool situation. Um, and so, yeah, I just found this book to just be, I mean, it, it, it made my, my, it, it started me on my faith journey as an adult. And, um, I just am endlessly grateful to John Mark Comer for writing this book and his other books. I've read them all. Um, I love them all as well. So, um, also if you are a Christian and you don't know, he has some really amazing resources on his website, um, that are COVID related. And so I really suggest, um, signing up for his newsletter. He doesn't like blast off stuff all the time. Um, and so 
it's it he has like these like little ebooks that he releases and so um yeah I found those to be super super helpful during COVID and so yeah Okay, the next book is The Picture of Dorian Gray by Oscar Wilde. So this says, in the center of the room, clamped... Well, this is just a quote. Um, in, this, in this, his only novel, Oscar Wilde retells the Faust legend with Watton as the temper, Hallward as the good angel, and Gray as the man willing to exchange his soul for what he most craves. This book caused a sensation in 1890 when it was published, not least for its barely veiled references to homosexuality. Wilde's biographer Richard Elman notes, no novel has commanded so much attention for years or awakened sentiments so contradictory in its readers. And so this book, Chef's Kiss, this book was so good. It was, it's short and sweet, you know, it's um, only 160, wait, let's get it right here. It is only, oh my word. Um, okay, it's only 190 pages, so very short. The writing quality of this is like bar none, some of the best writing I've ever read in my life. It is so witty and sharp, and when he is trying to write beautifully, it is so exquisite. It will make tears come to your eyes. Um, it's just, it's dark. Again, I'm going to use this word a lot because this is the kind of book I like, atmospheric. Um, and just brilliantly written. It doesn't drag on too long in certain parts as older books can tend to do. Um, and the plot is interesting. Again, a little bit un like it's unsettling, but it's not like downright scary. Um, and this is a perfect fall time read. Um, I mean, anytime read, all these books are anytime reads, but like this just screams fall and a cup of tea. Um, but yeah, I, man, um, Let's see if I can find a quote. I'm just opening that randomly. So this is a quote. There's a, a character in here. I think is Lord Henry Wotton. Um, yeah, I think so. So Lord Henry Wotton. And he's like this like character who just says things are so like contradictory to the times. And even now, like quite contradictory, even though times have changed quite a bit. Um, and I didn't agree with most of what he said. But man, it is so funny. Um, it's so sharp. So it says, my dear boy. This, so I, this is him talking to Dorian Gray. So it says, my dear boy, the people who love only once in their lives are really shallow people, are really the shallow people. What they call their loyalty and their fidelity, I call the lethargy of custom or their lack of imagination. Faithfulness is to the emotional life what consistency is to the life of the intellect. Simply a confession of failure. Faithfulness. I must analyze it someday. The passion for property is in it. There are many things that we would throw away if we were not afraid that others might pick them up. <laughs> wow, that is so freaking hilarious. Like, I don't, I don't agree with it, but I'm just like, that is so good. Um, and it also does have some truth in it. I think there are a lot of people who stay for like the reasons he said, but man, that's, it's just like killer. Like, it's just like that the whole time. It's just like knockout line after knockout line after knockout line. Um, and so I, it actually had a plot too. It just, it, it's, it's great. So very much recommend that. Um, the next book is The Last Unicorn by Peter S. Beagle. And it says, um, the unicorn lived. And so before I start, if you've ever seen, I, I don't know if it's 70s or 80s movie, it's an animated movie and the band America does the soundtrack. Um, I loved that movie as a kid. It was like my favorite movie for a really long time. And watching this adult, I'm like, this is scary and terrifying and trippy. Busty, Gumtina Krusty, Starly Husty. Oh, 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 I love you. Um, and this is the book that it was based off of. And so um, I don't know if you know who Patrick Rothfuss is, who is the author of a really popular series. I should write it. I'll hopefully like write it on the screen. The Name of the Wind is the first book. So yeah, he says it's like his, uh, the best book he's ever read. So I think it was published in the 70s or 60s and it says, here's the description, the unicorn lived in a lilac wood and she lived all alone. So she ventured out from the safety of the enchanted forest on a quest for others of her kind. Joined along the way by the bumbling mag magician Schmedrick, 
and the indomitable Molly Grew, the unicorn learns all the, about the joys and sorrows of life and love before meeting her destiny in a castle of a despondent monarch, monarch and confronting the creature that would drive her kind to, extin to extinction. Um, and so there is, like, you would think, um, first of all, it's not too long. It's like 270, 280 pages. Um, and you would think, like, they made this into a children's but um, children's movie. It must be pretty simple. But it's, like, it's actually, like, a, it's, like, a really good fantasy book. And it's just, like, unicorns and, like, that kind of, like, evil, um, evil, like, kingdom and magic and medieval vibes and just like mama fortuna's in it you know what i mean like that kind of thing i feel like i'm just making really weird words i'm making really weird words okay i feel like i'm giving it a really odd description but it is an odd book um and it's kind of got some elements of like uh old things and it has like a train it has like medieval elements and it has like a train in it and it's just kind of like all over the place um but in a really beautiful way. And it's genuinely really, really, really well written. And there are some passages that are, that are, um, that are really, really gorgeous. Um, like, let's see here. So, so the unicorn, it's, she's inside a cage in one part of the book from this like weird circus thing. Um, and so it said, she heard hearts bounce, tears brewing and breath going backward, but nobody said a word by the sorrow and loss and sweetness in their faces. She knew that they recognized her and she accepted their hunger as her homage. She thought of the hunter's great grandmother who wondered what it must be like to grow old and to cry. Um, and it's just like, oh, I have goosebumps. It's just like the innocence of the unicorn brings out the innocence in people that have been lost and oof man it's so beautiful i highly recommend this again it's not too long it is so worth your time and uh i i think about it often i really do it, it had some really beautiful descriptions um and so it's just a wonderful magical little world that i just i got lost in for a little bit um the next book is good old classic pride and prejudice by jane austen um, I have made my way through, I think, half of her books and literally love them. Um, they're all amazing. I think we all know what the, you know, Pride and Prejudice synopsis is. Um, I think we all know the plot. Elizabeth Bennet, her sisters, she meets Mr. Darcy. Mr. Darcy isn't really interested, but like secretly is. And, you know, there's some interesting situations that ensue and a happy ending. So, um... It's like you're not like I feel like most people if you haven't read it you've seen the movie or you know the plot so it's like you're not reading it to like find out what happens you're reading it to experience the brilliance of Jane Austen's writing. I have read this book once or twice and I have listened to it on audiobook once or twice and it just feels like home to me and I've watched the movies both the old one, the eight hour BBC, I think it's eight hours. Um, and then also the, the newer Jane Austen one, and they both have their pros and cons, but, um, guys, this is such a gorgeous book. I mean, if you haven't read it, it's like one of those things you just have to experience in life. You have to experience a Jane Austen. Um, and if you have a subscription to audible, again, I'm not sponsored. Not again. I just filmed a video where I was saying I wasn't sponsored by the things I was showing, but I'm not sponsored by anything, um, including Audible. <laughs> and, uh, but they have a really gorgeous Audible Originals where Rosamund Pike reads this. And she also has uh, one where she reads Sense and Sensibility. Um, and she just chef's kiss uh, as far as, as reading of a book goes. Um, so I could not recommend that enough if you are like, I'd like to listen to this. Um, my only thing is sometimes for me with audiobooks, I get distracted and then I'm like, I don't feel like I really absorbed something and Jane Austen's writing for my level can be kind of like complicated at times, like really wordy. Um, and so it's something where it's like, I feel like I need to be paying attention. So as a first time, I would probably just read it. But at the same time, if you're willing to be like really paying attention, I think the aud the audible version is just amazing top notch audiobook. So can't recommend my girl Jane Austen enough and Pride and Prejudice so far is still my favorite. I think I've read Persuasion and Sense and Sensibility and I think I'm moving on to Emma. So yeah, I don't know. 
Um, so what do we have here? Okay. So, um, Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. Okay. I'm sorry if I kind of moved. Um, I basically just wanted to make sure that my video camera was still recording because my last video I did, it wasn't. <laughs> Anyways, um, so Revolutionary Road by Richard Yates. I'm just going to read the description on the back because I feel like it'll probably do it more justice. Um, and so it says, in the hopeful 1950s, Frank and April Wheeler appear to be a model couple, bright, beautiful, talented, with two young children and a starter home in the suburbs. Perhaps they married too young and started a family too early. Maybe Frank's job is dull. And April never saw herself as a housewife. Yet they have always lived on the assumption that greatness is only just around the corner. And now that certainly is about to crumble. With heartbreaking compassion and remorseless clarity, Richard Yates shows how Frank and April mortgage their spiritual birthright, betraying not only each other, but their best selves. That is a perfect description. This is a book where it's more of a character study than a lot of stuff happens. It's a book where the dialogue is... Sorry about that. It's a book where the dialogue is fierce and I hate the word fierce I feel like it's become really an annoying word um it's just like it said it says with heartbreaking compassion and remorseless clarity he describes how these people who are so idealistic and didn't want to fit into the norm you know the nine to five house in the suburbs kids puzzle but just ended up there and just how their lives really crumble apart. Um, it's a study on their relationship on themselves as characters. Um, when I first uh, was reading this book and I found out that there was this movie where um, Leo DiCaprio and Kate Winslet were the, um, were the main characters, I was like, oh, wow. I couldn't have even like imagined more perfect characters um, to play or perfect people to play these characters. It didn't really translate, um, really didn't. So I wouldn't recommend if you've seen the movie and you're like, oh, it's dull. Um, it's kind of lacking something. I don't know what it's lacking, but there's something that's not there. Um, I, I wouldn't let that deter you from reading the book because it is stunning. And there are really, really just stunning moments, stunning descriptions. Um, it's like almost like in um, magical realism where it's like they just zone in on a moment and they just are able to pick it apart with such clarity. Um, I feel like that, that same kind of, um, thing is applied here. So I, yeah, I really, 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 really liked this. Um, I highly recommend, but yeah, I really, really, I really like this. And I found, I saw a lot of myself in April, um, especially as I was really depressed when I read this. Um, and that's, it's not, flattering you know they're very flawed characters if it's something where you like your characters to not be flawed do not pick this book up they are both very flawed um but yeah i i found this to just be just so but yeah i just found this to be like such a beautiful intimate portrait of this like family who's kind of like fitting in the Americana bubble, but doesn't want to be. Um, and I would, I would highly recommend this to someone who's wanting something that's a character study that's more literary than plot driven. The next book that I'm going to talk about is, um, it's called The Romance of Tristan and Usult by Joseph Bedir, retold by Joseph Bedir. I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, probably not. Translated by Hilary Belloc and completed by Paul Rosenfeld. I don't know if these are good translators. I don't know if this is like a really good translated copy. I don't know if there's other translators out there. Honestly, I haven't looked into it that much. But this is probably my favorite out of all these. I can't distinctly say that. Um, but this is a, this is the first complete English edition, brilliantly translated Throughout, it retains the beauty and sense of fatality that have made it one of the one of legendary literature's most fascinating tales. A time of chivalry and doomed transcendent love. 
the romance of Tristan and Isolde is one of the most resonant works of, of Western literature, as well as the basis for our enduring idea of romance. The story of the Cornish knight and the English princess, or the Irish princess, who meet by deception, fall in love by magic, and pursue that love in defiance of heavenly and earthly law has inspired artists from Matthew Arnold to Richard Wagner. But nowhere has it been as retold with greater eloquence and dignity than Joseph Badir's edition, which weaves several medieval sources into a seamless whole, elegantly translated by Hilary blah blah and blah blah. <laughs> um, this is incomparable. This is a epic poem. It's written like a novel. People hear epic poem and they think of like Paradise Lost or something really complicated. It's not. It's just, it's like a regular book. It reads like poetry. I mean, it really does. Um, this was the first book that really made me fall in love with literature, like hardcore. I'd actually already really enjoyed it, but this was like, this was the tipping point. I was in um, English Lit and I had this really amazing teacher and she was this like fiery little redhead, little sprite, grumpy, grumpy gal. And she just like loved me, which was so awesome. But anyways, she was very, very smart. And she had read us all these like different plays and like translated Chaucer's, um, Chaucer's, how am I? Canterbury Tales she like would read that and then like kind of like read the the English and the middle English and then tell us what it meant and she was just such an inspiration but she um just told told me about this tale she was just well she was talking to the class and she just was talking about this tragic love story um and you know how old it is I think it's from like the 1400 I think it's older than the 1400s but I think this Joseph Badir version is from the 1400s and then it's been like translated from there I don't know I'm saying that correctly. Um, but either way, it's real old. And like it said, it's, it's weaved together from many medieval sources, but, um, this doomed love story is so wonderful. It's short. It's not overly long. It doesn't drag on. I think it's 200, 200 pages and, um, you just cannot go wrong with this. It is a dream to read. If you love poetry, if you love tragic love stories, if you love transcendent love stories, if you just love love, if you love romance and romance with a capital R, if you love any of those things, I mean, this is it. And it's also medieval, which I just love medieval stories. Clearly, there's been a few in here that I have recommended. Um, there's like this one part specifically where they drink this drought that she is meant to drink with her husband on um on their wedding night to like make them fall in love so she'll actually be happy and she accidentally drinks it with Tristan and that's how they fall madly madly in love um and again this is not something where you're you're so much reading it for the plot you're reading it for um for the for the quality of the writing um but yeah so they're in the ship and they accidentally drink it and basically the I want to try and find it I need to find this eventually Okay, so there's this part where basically they accidentally drink this and then this like maid servant comes in and and she's the one who was like, I think, in charge of it, of like getting this to the right people. And then she realizes that they've accidentally drank this love potion created by um, Yasult's mother. And she says, um, and she just says, you have drunk not love alone, but love and death together. The lovers held each other. Life and desire trembled through their youth. And Tristan said, well then, come death. And as evening fell upon the bark that healed and ran to King Mark's land, they gave themselves up utterly to love. That is goosebumps again. That is just so beautiful. I need to do a rereading of that. But it is, it is a stunning, stunning epic poem. It is literally the stuff of legends and it is um, tragic and gorgeous and sad. And I just feel like I keep running out of words to describe things, but trust me, folks, it does not disappoint. Um, and it keeps a good pace, you know, 
Um, and then lastly, I have The Lord of the Rings, specifically the first book. I have this cool kind of vintage Canadian edition. Um, and then I have this cool vintage floppy as hell, which we know we love. Um, uh, edition of all three bound together. Um, and so I freaking love Lord of the Rings. I'm not like a diehard fan. I just really like it. This is my first time fully reading through the first novel. I am moving on to the second and third one, but it, I've been like meaning to move on to the second and third one for like years. I don't know what it is. It's something where it's like, I really enjoy the reading, but it doesn't grab me enough to like make me want to like hurry through it. So it's like a kind of meander my way through it and enjoy the quality of writing. Um, and so I'm just in this weird place right now where I, yeah, I don't know. I, um, what can I say? I really like it. I really love Lord of the Rings. I think we all kind of know the general the general story, it says, The Lord of the Rings is not a book to be described in a few sentences. It is heroic romance, something which has scarcely been attempted on the scale since Spencer's Fairy Queen, so one can't praise the book by comparison. There is nothing to compare it with. Um, for width of imagination, it almost beggars peril, and it's nearly as remarkable for its vividness as for the narrative skill. Okay, so that really isn't too helpful. It says the fellowship of the ring delineates immense power of the one ring and begins an extraordinary heroic tale of war and adventure, which continues on in the next two books. Okay. Neither of those descriptions really helped. Bottom line. Um, I just read those two descriptions. They weren't very helpful, but I would just say it's a tale of the one ring, a heroic tale, um, involving hobbits and wizards and elves you know i think most people know the lord of the rings yeah <laughs> so uh, i don't think you're so much reading it to find out what happens as like for just like following along on this epic adventure and uh it's just beautiful high fantasy and um yeah i really really love it really enjoy it and I, so i highly highly recommend it and what can be said i mean it's just it feels it feels like um, transcendent. I don't know. It just feels ancient. It feels like it was written. Like it's like a history of something that actually happened. It feels so fleshed out and so final. And the character development is amazing. And there's, it feels like everyone's fleshed out because it is. Like he literally created obviously this whole world. And it feels so well thought out. And it just really shows. So um, just an amazing book, obviously. And... Um, another book that I'm going to talk about that I also don't own physically is, um, the book Annihilation from the Southern Reach Trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer. Um, this book is the first book in this trilogy. I am on the third book and didn't enjoy the second and not enjoying the third as much as the first, but um, they're still good. I'm not regretting reading them or having read them, but they just don't live up to the first one. Um, if you've seen the movie, there's a lot missing from the movie with Natalie Portman, um, that happens in the book, which is the usual case, but I do feel like they captured the vibe of the book really well, especially with the soundtrack. My recommendation is to listen to the, like, watch the trailer and like listen to the creepy soundtrack um and then get into the book because that just like plays in the back of your head as you're reading and it's so creepy the book is following this and there's no names they don't you know what i'm just gonna read the description it says area x has been cut off from the rest of the world for decades nature has reclaimed the last vestiges of human civilization the first expedition returned with reports of pristine edenic 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 Garden of Eden landscape. The second expedition ended in mass suicide, the third in a hail of gunfire as its members turned on one another. The members of the 11th expedition returned as shadows of their former selves and within, within weeks all died of cancer. In Annihilation, the first volume of, the Jeff, of Jeff Vandermeer's Southern Reach trilogy, we join the 12th expedition. The group is made up of four women, an anthropologist, a surveyor, a psychologist, the de facto leader, and our narrator, a biologist. Their mission is to map the terrain, record all observations of their surroundings and of one another, and above all, avoid being con contaminated by Area X itself. 
They arrive expecting the unexpected and Area X delivers, but it's the surprises that came across the border with them and the secrets the expedition members are keeping from one another that change everything. And so this book is unsettling to its core. It's atmospheric. It's, um, it's tense. It's taut. It's, it's a very fast paced book. It doesn't linger too long. It's incredibly well written. Um, and it doesn't leave you with many answers. So if you're trying to get a book where you feel like things are wrapped up with a neat bow at the end, this is not the book. But if you're willing to be creeped out and scared and weirded out and like confused and just enjoy the writing adventure that you're, that you're, you know, on, it's an amazing, amazing book that will take you on a ride. Um, and so these are all of my books that are my favorite books to date. Um, these books all have special meanings and they've all, um, come along with me on the journey of life. Um, and I wouldn't trade having read these books for like anything. They just mean so much to me. And thank you so much for taking the time to watch my video. If you have any recommendations, if you've read the books, let me know what you think. If you read the book because I recommended it, let me know what you thought. Um, anything, just, you know, like, subscribe, comment. It helps out my channel so much. And I always love new book recommendations. And I always love to hear other people's thoughts on books. Um, so let me know what you thought, what you think. Um, I really appreciate you guys. And thanks so much for tuning in.